address for a first name and a last name, and that's all that was on that form. <laughs> and I'm the only one that filled one out. <laughs> Which tells you everything you need to know right there, right? I normally like to start out with a political joke, but I'm not, I don't approve of political jokes because I've seen too many get elected. <laughs> more minutes just to save you the curiosity. Uh, we're here to talk about something very, very important. That's going to be uh, the Cibolo Preserve, the Cibolo Creek, the whole system, the whole water system around here. Um, I, I have been a big fan of this environment. I've been a regular out here at Cibolo Nature Center for probably 12, 13 years now. Uh, I'm an avid birder. I, report all my sightings to Cornell University, so I'm an amateur ornithologist when you get down to it. I have my own person assigned to me who challenges me when I report a bird that's in an area that shouldn't be there. Are you sure you saw a surf scooter down there? And I'm like, I got a picture of it. Um, it's fun to debate with those guys. I don't like to debate with everybody. Anyway, so yeah, I've been a regular here. I, uh, um, my wife and I, uh, when we run, we run on the trails down there. Um, and I've, I've met a lot of really interesting folks down there. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of the environment, have been for a long time. And I think what we're here to talk about is kind of important. Um, so without going too much further, I want to thank and recognize the, the Board of Trustees for the Cibolo Preserve that are here. There's quite a few of you here that I just met today. Can you guys raise your hands or stand up? <laughs> Absolutely nothing about the nature preserve. I'm going to go on a tour on it here in a couple of weeks, and I appreciate you guys inviting me out there. Um, I only know Civil Nature Center and Farm. Uh, we also have a lot of folks from the university. The, just want to thank the students and the, and the professors who have done so much work in and around this area. Um, I'm aware of some of the stuff that UTSA and others do, and thank you guys for all the things you do for this environment. And then to the staff at Cibolo uh, Nature Preserve, thank you guys for what you do. Uh, I'm sorry, Cibolo Nature Center. Um, you guys have been always friendly to me. I've done all kinds of things out there. The nighttime, the moon, the, what's it called, the moonlight series. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there with my dog running around on the leash. So I remember that. Anyway, it's good stuff. So I, I got some interesting news last night that's timely. Um, in my role as city council and as mayor-elect, all of a sudden a lot more information is shared with me. And I got this email last night at 5.30, and I wanted to read it because it actually applies to what we're talking about today, if, you're, if you'll indulge me. It says, the TCEQ called today, and the draft 303D list, do you guys know what that is? Yeah. That's the bad list. For those that don't know what that is, that's, that's a list of uh, impaired water bodies. Uh, so the TCEQ called last night, and they have indicated that <clears throat> the The upper Cibolo is scheduled to be delisted for bacteria and chlorides. It's been on that list for a long time as an impaired water body, and there have been a lot of things that Cibolo Nature Center, the Cibolo Preserve, there have been the, the Cibolo uh, watershed stuff that was done in the past that takes that whole upper region and said we have bacteria problems, we have chloride problems. I didn't know about all this stuff, but I got this email yesterday, and I'm like, wow, that's Providence that I got this email. And I get to tell you guys today that it's going to be delisted. I, I did some research on the TCEQ website and I didn't realize that it had been on that list since 2006. I know there's been a couple of federal grants that have been uh, offered to the city and the community area to work on that and help educate people on what needs to be done from a conservation standpoint and preserve this precious, precious resource that we have around us. How many of you know what Cibolo means? Buffalo! I didn't know that. <laughs> you do a little bit of homework. It's funny, I'll go to Cibolo, Texas, and the mascot in Cibolo, Texas is the Buffalo. I get it now. And how many of you realize that the whole upper northeast quadrant of Bear County is the Cibolo Creek? I never knew that until I was getting ready for today. It's amazing what you have to learn when you want to talk about this stuff. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully, I'm going to learn a lot more today. I'm sure we all will. Uh, but thank you for letting me come and just have a couple of opening comments. I would also add that as mayor-elect, and I'm not talking, I'm not stumping right now, 
One of the important things that we have built over the last two years, three years now, is this thing called the master plan, the 10 year master plan for Vernon. And I, I'm sure that some of you had input on that. That was adopted by the city council in August of last year. I was on city council and I helped adopt that. Formal, former council member Joe Azito is also here and he's been involved in, in the construction of that over the prior two years. That master plan to me is really, really important because it says what does this community, not just the city, but what does this community want to be in the next 10 years as we continue to grow up? All right, we're not all grown up yet. And I think it strikes a good balance between what we need as human beings and houses and development and economics. I think it strikes a good balance with what we need in terms of green space and preservation of the important natural resources around us. Um, and as a uh, 40 plus year avid outdoorsman, I spend a lot of time in the woods, not because I'm lost, but because <laughs> some of you are out there. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm just a big outdoorsman. I'm, I'm a big, um, like I said, I'm a big birder. I, I try to go up the mountains and do uh, five to six day hikes twice a year, um, just me and a couple of buddies and whatever we carry on our back. I'm an ultralight guy, so I only carry about 13 pounds and go live in deep in backcountry areas across the U.S. So I'm just a big outdoorsman. I, I really love this area. I love that our master plan is trying to balance the good parts of nature with the good parts of responsible human beings. And we gotta balance that at all times and we can't lose sight of that as we continue to go forward. Um, and that's some of the stuff that I'm excited about influencing, um, certainly with a, um, a much more inclusive hand as we go forward. Woo. <laughs> <Question. Otherwise, I'm laughs> <on that. laughs> so thanks again to the uh, Civil Nature Center staff. Uh, like I said before, I've met many of you. You don't run, run, you don't remember me, but I've talked to you over the last ten years. You guys have been awesome. You've always been very welcoming, and it's a great facility. So um, we're going to get on to the real part of today. So let me introduce the CEO of the Civil Nature Center and Farm, Miss Caroline Chipman Evans. <laughs> chest recently. My grandmother <clears throat> lived at Sutsus, which is a um, house on the what was the original Herf Ranch, um, right above the Fern Bank, which is protected now by the Cibolo Preserve. Um, she um, loved nature and had a very short life. She died at 18 years old in childbirth mm -hmm. with my mother and Aunt Carolyn. But before she died, she wrote this story. And I wanted to share it with you because I think it is a story that um, 
we all can relate to. And it's just a little bit of why we love the Cibolo from our hearts. It's called the description of an outdoor scene. As I walked down the little path, gathering flowers from each side, I thought that it was by far the loveliest spot I had ever seen. The trees grew very close to it, so close sometimes that I had to stop and push the branches out of the way. Under the trees grew the first anemones of spring, and the moss on the path was as soft as a carpet. In the distance, I heard birds singing and the faint, trick and the faint trickling of water creeping along slowly so I might catch a glimpse of him, I came to a tree entirely covered with fragrant white blossoms. I could not resist, and I had to gather a few before I could go on. Suddenly, the path turned to the left and down a gentle slope, all covered with moss and flowers, and the path turned into steps leading down to a glade where a spring of clear water bubbled. On the little bank around it grew maidenhair ferns. Suddenly, quite close, the clear, sweet notes of the birds rang out, and looking up, I perched, uh, uh, sorry, and looking up, I saw perched on the branch of a wild plum tree, the brightest bit of crimson against the bluest sky. Wow. <laughs> she wrote this when she was 16. <coughs> for keeping the firm day.
She retired from the Botanical Garden and became the chairman of the board of the Cibolo Preserve. The preserve is in great hands with Candace's deep care and dedication. Please welcome. goes on and on, and a lot of you are sitting here right now. Our other major research partner is the University of Texas San, at San Antonio College of Sciences, and I hope you were able to visit with some of the professors and see the wonderful array of projects that are going on. We are so proud of the fine work that they're doing. They've conducted studies in geology and botany, water quality, small mammals, and even bat acoustics. <coughs> Their studies are building on the data that they're collecting. This is exactly the kind of science that Bill Lindy would be championing. And I can still remember the absolute glee he felt when he was up there almost, he was here at the preserve almost daily, to meet those young researchers and pepper them with questions and learn everything he could about their projects. It was just a match made in heaven started back in 2008. We thank also the San Antonio River Authority, Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife, and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality for their ongoing support of environmental studies at the preserve. And I want to recognize my fellow trustees, and I'm going to make them stand. <laughs> <laughs> J.W. Peeper. Thank you guys. We 
are a team together. We have gotten to know one another so well, and we work together so well. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's a team of people that Bill Lindy hand chose to use for people important. So what an honor now to introduce Dr. Sansom as our keynote speaker. He, from everything I hear, Andy, you are Mr. Water in Texas. <laughs> Formerly Executive Director of Texas Parks and Wildlife, he serves as Executive Director of the U.S. <coughs> Center for Water and Environment at Texas State University, where he coordinates university policy and research related to fresh water resources, manages the headwaters of the San Marcos River, administers the most extensive freshwater environmental education program in Texas, and supervises the training coordination of more than a thousand volunteer water monitors in rivers and streams throughout Texas. We couldn't be more pleased to welcome you today. Thank you, Candace, and thank you all for having me. Candace uh, has just shown you that she possesses, forgive me, Jim, the most important characteristic of a politician, and that is that with that introduction, she was able to make things sound better than they actually are. <laughs> <laughs> Which always reminds me of a man who was trying to get some insurance for his family, and he was filling out the forms, and he got to the part where he had to say what had happened to his parents. Well, the problem was his father had been hanged, and so I didn't know exactly how that would go over, but in order to make things sound better than they actually were, he wrote on the form that his father had died at the age of 69 while participating in a public ceremony when the platform collapsed. <laughs> and JW and Uber took us, Nona and I, out to see the preserve today, and it is truly one of the most stunning places that I've been to in the Texas Hill Country. But it was also uh, remarkable to almost sense Bill's presence and his impact on the landscape out there as we went through the site, and to hear about what his vision was, what his dedication to it was. There, we are so fortunate in Texas that there have been people like that who have been willing to commit their time, their energy, their resources to, to make things like that preserve happen. And its significance to us becomes more important every day. It's also a, an honor for me to be here with Carolyn Chipman Evans. Many of you, I'm sure, probably know that a couple of weeks ago, Nona and I and Karen Hunky, who is here, and perhaps some of the rest of you, were participated in a luncheon in Austin where Carolyn was named one of the 2019 Terry Hershey Women in Conservation Award winners. And it, that is the highest award that women in conservation can achieve in Texas, and it was inspiring to be there when Carolyn and the other women who received the award were honored. I appreciated what the mayor-elect mayor and, and Carolyn and, and Candace have all said about the Hill Country. I know that all of us uh, understand the incredible, iconic resources that we are privileged to enjoy here in the Hill Country, but also understand that we're facing unprecedented challenges. I, um, I grew up in the Houston area where the rivers are slow and murky and uh, came over here to visit relatives uh, 
along the Guadalupe above hunt every summer. Nona and I spent our honeymoon in an old family lodge on the Guadalupe above, above hunt. When I was a graduate student the first time at Texas Tech, my professor assigned me to find, photograph, and write the history of every railroad tunnel in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out there was only five. <laughs> and one of them is Old Tunnel, which is on the old San Antonio Road. And I came here and trespassed on that property for my project in 1965. I became more directly involved in conservation in the hill country when I came back from Washington as fast as I could with Nona and went to work for the Nature Conservancy. At that time, the Nature Conservancy was located above a pornography shop in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> and there were probably 35 people that contributed $100 or more to the organization every year. So what I did was I moved it to San Antonio as fast as I could. And there is where I met David Bamber, Bill Lindy, Herb Stumberg, Tim and Karen Hickson, people who have really made a difference in conservation over the years and helped get that organization on its feet. That's also where I encountered for the first time a property called Honey Creek. And I hadn't really done my homework because if I had, I would have found out that the Nature Conservancy owed three and a half million dollars on Honey Creek with absolutely no possibility of paying it off. By the way, that's where I first met J.W. Peeper was at Honey Creek. So by hook or by crook, we were able to ultimately have Honey Creek Preserve added to the uh, Guadalupe River State Park, where it is managed as one of the state's premier natural areas today. Where our offices, I was telling some of my friends here today that our offices in those days in San Antonio were located in the building known as the Crockett Block, which is the early 20th century building that is between the Hyatt and the Alamo, and our offices face right in the front door of the Alamo. It, it was, had to be one of the coolest places that I've ever had the opportunity to work. But more importantly, we were able to get the organization on its feet by charging people to come to the office to watch the parades. <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would set up a buffet and have some wine and uh, people would come and we'd reserve places on the sidewalk and we finally got the organization in the black. So, not only because of Honey Creek, but because of other projects that we did in those days with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Many of you, uh, it's hard to imagine that now we're talking 1986, that the state legislature became extremely critical of Parks and Wildlife for not acquiring enough land. The last time this state ever passed a bond issue for the purchase of parks, and is still true today, was when John Connolly was governor. That's the last time that we've passed a statewide bond issue for the purchase of land for conservation. And in 19, that was passed very commonly. And by 1985, they still had $25 million of it left. And it was a $75 million bond issue. So in 20, 20 years, they still had a third of the money unspent. And so as you know, this uh, legislature has a, what I think is a really good uh, process called sunset, which means that every decade or so, state agencies go through a process where they basically have to justify their existence. But it also gives uh, stakeholders and legislators the opportunity to bring reforms to the agency. And one of the things that was brought down hard was that we needed to acquire more land, particularly natural areas in Texas. And so I went to work for the Parks and Wildlife Department as a land guy. Basically what I used to say, I was a century 21 in Parks and Wildlife. <laughs> and I was 
I've always benefited from being in the right place at the right time because I went to work there in uh, December of 1987, just in time for the savings and loan crisis. <laughs> so I had $25 million and all, about half of the state was for sale. <laughs> so, so I went through the $25 million in two and a half years and bought 500,000 acres of land, including the old Tunnel State Park, which uh, I had visited as a graduate student at Texas Tech, and they made me the executive director. And I will tell you that I've had a sensational life. But that was an unbelievable privilege to work with people like Ruth Stevens all over the state. <laughs> Parks and Wildlife has probably the lowest turnover of any state agency, and it's because people are so dedicated to their jobs and do such a wonderful job for the rest of us. But there were things that I was not prepared for. I remember the first day of, that I went to work, I was, in, I was shaving getting ready to go and I was listening to the radio and I heard that an oil spill had hit Galveston Bay and the Parks and Wildlife Department was in charge of cleaning it up. But on the second day of the job, I got to ride the battleship of Texas from its birth in the shipyard with the governor of the state to its permanent home in the San Jacinto Battleground. I had the most wonderful experiences rafting the Rio Grande with former Governor Ann Richards. And I remember one evening I came home from one of those trips and I was telling Nona what a wonderful time I'd had. And, and I couldn't stop talking about the opportunity to visit with the governor of the state about conservation, not only in Texas, but in Mexico as well. And I got a call about 11 o'clock at night saying that one of our Texas game wardens had shot and killed a man in East Texas and they were waiting for my instructions. <laughs> so there were things that I ended up having to address that I had absolutely no preparation for and grew up in a hurry. I got the opportunity to see more of Texas than most people should be able to see in a lifetime. I began to understand the incredible diversity, not only of the landscape, but the cultures in Texas. But I got called just about every name it's possible to call anybody in Texas. And someone said to me one time, that's a big vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> what I, one of the things I learned in a hurry was that although buying land is the fun part, managing and operating it is the hard part. And I used to say, that the good news was that fewer people were smoking because the entire state park system at that time was, was supported by taxes on cigarettes. <laughs> Two pennies per pack went to state and local parks across the state. And, and that plus the revenue that you collect when you enter a state park or in a campground, that was all the budget. Half Half of the number of people that were smoking when that law was passed were smoking in the early 1990s. And so the revenue in real terms had dropped by half. So I figured, well, this is easy. I'll find a friendly legislator that's willing to raise that two cents to four cents, and at least we'll get back to even. Well, I found a guy that was willing to do it. He introduced the bill. And on the first day of the legislature, all of the cigarette tax money had been taken away from Parks and Wildlife. So now we're at zero. So I spent the whole first three months of the legislature trying to figure out a way to get the money back. And finally, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who was a great friend of Parks and Wildlife, Senator John Monford from Lubbock, said, there's only one person that you're going to talk, be able to talk to about this, and that was Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock. So I got an appointment with Bullock, and I went to see him, and I'm sitting across his desk, 
and he's got his feet up on the desk. And the first thing he said to me was, I shot 325 quail in one day. <laughs> I figured that was just to get me off guard. <laughs> then he looks at me and he's chain smoking. And he blows a big puff of smoke in my face and he says, what do you want? <laughs> I said, Governor, I'm here to see what I need to do to get that cigarette tax restored. <laughs> <laughs> We're not spending that money on parks. We're going to spend it on cancer research. <laughs> I said, well, that makes sense to me, but we can't go cold turkey all at once. <laughs> You're not listening to me. No more cigarette money for state parks. I said, well, Governor, what, what are my alternatives? Takes a deep breath. <sighs> Suicide. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next morning, I had probably 50 people lined, at, lined up to come to the hearing to try to get that money back. Senator Monford gaveled the meeting to order. He says, issue number one, cigarette tax restored. So the lesson was, you don't ever come up here and talk about money without getting my permission first. And the next session of the legislature... Bullock and Monford and a wonderful state representative from the Rio Grande Valley partnered to exchange that cigarette money for the taxes that you pay on sporting goods, which was taking a, a declining source that had nothing to do with state parks and replacing it with a growing source that had everything to do with the out of doors. <clears throat> Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a commercial. They've never appropriated all of it. The Senate this week passed a bill that would send a constitutional amendment to the voters next fall, presuming the House passes it, that would allow you and I to vote to permanently dedicate that money for the acquisition, the operation, and the repair of the infrastructure within state parks. I told you that I learned stuff. If I, when they push me into the crematorium, I still hope that I'm holding a deed for another piece of wildlife management area or preserve or park. But I also learned that if the state gave a guy like me the entire state budget, everything, for highways, hospitals, prisons, everything, to buy land with, it would only change the amount of land in public ownership by maybe 1%. The biggest terrestrial environmental problem that we face, and it relates directly to our water supplies and our water quality, is the continued fragmentation of family land in Texas. Larry and Liz O'Neill are my neighbors at Stonewall. We had a pipeline built across our land in, in 1928. In 1928, in order to get all the way across Gillespie County, which we still consider today a rural county, they dealt with 12 landowners. In 2011, that pipeline was removed and repurposed down in the Eagle Ford, and they dealt with 250 landowners. Our landscape is coming apart as we speak. We have to find ways to keep ancestral people on family lands. And I want to tell you something. Because of good land stewardship by private landowners in Texas, the landscape is better than it was prior to 1900. If you want to look at accounts, biological accounts of Texas between, say, 1885 and 1905, all of the timber in East Texas have been cut. 
The rest of the state had been so overgrazed. We lost 15 inches of soil in the hill country, such that by the time Lyndon Johnson began his ascent, the hill country was the poorest place in the United States along with Appalachia. And it was because of terrible, terrible abuse of the landscape when the Europeans first came out of the trees to settle our state. The state is in far better condition today than it was prior to 1900. And yet, we lose rural and agricultural land faster than any other state. We lost probably two million acres of rural and agricultural land between 1997 and 2007 alone. So there is almost nothing more important for us to do, both for our recharge areas, our watersheds, our wildlife habitat, and all of the things that we get from the landscape than trying to find ways to keep private landowners on the land and doing the right thing for the rest of us. One of the biggest challenges that we have is having people in urban areas where most of us live today understand the values that they get from the rural landscape. Urban people have no clue that, that all, many of the things that they enjoy are there because the landscape is there and in good shape. Today, water quality issues are almost entirely related to what we call non-point source pollution, which is basically water that is running off parking lots, running off agricultural fields or rooftops. That, that's where most water quality problems originate today. We, when, I, when I was in high school, I commuted to school through the petrochemical plants along the Houston Ship Channel and in the Freeport area. And, and we go over a canal one day that would be red, the next day it would be green. Well, we've got a handle on that, thanks to the Clean Water Act, what we call point port source pollution, where you can actually point to a discharge, has been pretty much resolved. So the issues that we face in terms of our water quality are related to the management of the landscapes within our watersheds. And that's why this effort that is centered around the Cibolo Creek Preserve that is extending beyond and up and down Cibolo Creek to protect that watershed is so critical. Um, many of you know that, that I, my wife and I have had a 40-year relationship with J. David Bamberger. And it's only become apparent to me recently that the water that comes off of the Bamberger Ranch near Johnson City is something like 1,500 acre feet a year. And it flows under the Congress Avenue Bridge and is consumed by people in Austin. And yet, most of them have absolutely no clue that the management of properties like that mean everything to their ability to, to have clean supplies of water. The other issue that I think is plaguing us is the fact that we treat groundwater and surface water in Texas as if they were completely different substances. So think about the Blanco. The Blanco starts here in Kendall County. It flows southeastward toward where I work in Hayes County. And before it gets to the Hayes County line, it goes right back into the aquifer through the riverbed. It flows underground to a sensational spring called Jacob's Well, which many of you may have visited, which is at the headwaters of Cypress Creek. It comes back up out of the ground at Jacob's Well. It flows down Cypress Creek through the city of Wimberley and back into the Blanco. Now, if you just wanted to get a water rights permit to take any appreciative amount of water out of the Blanco, it would be denied because it's already overcommitted. But if you want to go up above Jacob's Well and drill a hole in the ground, you can pump just about as much of it as your man or woman enough to pump without hardly any regulation. And it's the same water. If you have children that are asking you what they should do when they get out of school, you might want to advise them to be water lawyers because there's going to be a whole lot of litigation in the years ahead 
between people who have been told since we were a colony of Spain that the water in our rivers and streams belongs to the state and people who live above places like Jacob's Well whom the courts have recently told that the same water belongs to them. Now don't let me mislead you by having you understand that I'm an advocate, not an advocate for private landowners and the interest that they have in the water under their property. Imagine a family that lives out here in the hill country that has been dependent for generations on a spring on their property. Don't tell me they don't have an interest in their groundwater. But if, if the neighbor sells the water and pumps them dry and the spring goes away, then it means everything to their livelihood and their lifestyle and their way of life. But having said that, we've got to find a way to reconcile our management of surface water and groundwater so that we begin to understand that it's the same resource. Otherwise, we're gonna lose some of the most iconic water features that, I mean, they're all around us. And don't, don't believe that places even like the San Marcos Springs, which is the second largest artesian spring in the Western United States, could not go away unless we get a handle on managing the water in the old country. Here's the bottom line. We're gonna have twice as many people in Texas in the next 50 years, and yet we have already given permission for more water to be withdrawn from our rivers than is in them today. And yet we're gonna to have to find water for twice as many people in the next 50 years. This is the most serious natural resource issue facing the coming generation. And it means everything, not only to our continued economic development, but to everything that we get from the environment in Texas, both from the standpoint of recreation, from the standpoint of spiritual renewal, from the standpoint of ecological health, and all the other things that we get from the environment. Now, let me tell you, another way to look at it is we're pretty fortunate. Across the world, the average woman walks nine miles every day just to get water for her family. That means that she can't work, she can't take care of her kids, she's gotta spend all day long walking just to get water for sanitation and cooking. Every 20 seconds across the world, someone dies because of poor water quality or lack of water and most of them are children. While we're here together this afternoon, probably 65 people are gonna pass away from problems related directly to the lack of water or poor water quality. So we, we got it pretty good compared to people elsewhere in the world. But we cannot, we cannot let our guard down. Every single community in the Hill Country is now facing water quality, water quantity, every single one, and they come to us, Blanco, Wimberley, every community. There's a subdivision going on in Bull Verde proposed above Honey Creek, which would discharge 140,000 gallons, million gallons a day into Honey Creek, which is so pristine that the state parks won't even allow you to take your pet in there because of fears of E. coli contamination within that creek. So we've got the challenge of a lifetime on our hands. People ask me all the time, you know, with all those dire statistics that you're quoting, what can I do? What can I do? I'm a school teacher, I'm a attorney, I'm an accountant, I'm an engineer. I'm a housewife, what can I do to help us solve this problem? Remember I told you that almost all of us are growing up in urban areas, which means that most children in Texas today are not exposed to the out of doors as they were when I was a child. 
back in the early 1990s when Rufus and I worked together and so many of my colleagues at Parks and Wildlife, we began to understand how critical an issue this was. And I remember taking a group of African American children from the east side of Austin canoeing on the Lampasas River. And you know, when we got them in those canoes, you'd have thought they were in spaceships because they had never, most of them had never been out of Travis County, much less in a canoe. But we had great adult leaders, volunteers helping us with these kids, and within an hour or so, you'd have thought they'd been in canoes all their lives. And we spent about six hours on the river, and we got to the sandbar where we were taken out, and one of the adult leaders was standing on the sandbar, skipping rocks. And one of these children said, did you see what that dude did? <laughs> and we realized that none of those kids had ever seen anyone skip a rock. So we got them out of the canoes, and we spent the next couple of hours teaching them how to skip rocks. <laughs> and that night, after the dishes were washed and the food, you know, food was put away, and the adult leaders, both black and white, were sitting around the campfire telling stories. And those children were back down on the river in the pitch black dark, skipping rocks. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons why places like the Civil and Nature Center are so critical is that they are places where children can understand that the outdoors is fun, that it's crucial to our existence and our way of life, but that they must learn to take responsibility for. And there's almost nothing we can do that's more important than to make sure that our children get that lesson. And every single one of us can take the time during the course of a year to do that. Thank you all very much.
so below watershed. This is not something the federal government comes in and does for burning. This is not something that the state comes in and does for burning. This is something that the citizens of our community do. All the work, the 30 years of the Nature Center, all the years of the preserve, this is all done by the care from individuals and the generosity of individuals that makes it, all this work possible. Um, so we count on you, we need you, but there's several things you can do. One of them, and Andy spoke um, wonderfully, he set me up perfectly for this, one of these things that you can do is consider a conservation easement on your land. If you have land and you don't want to see it fragmented, you don't want to pass it on to your children to watch them turn it into the next subdivision, you can put a conservation easement on it. My husband, Brent, stand up, say hi, show me your face. Brent, another partner in conservation, runs the Civil Oak Conservancy, which is a land trust for our region. Um, if you're interested in considering protecting your land, we can talk about that. Um, and there's ways to do it that can really um, help protect some more of these wonderful places like the Civil Oak Reserve and others, um, treasures in our, in our community. Um, you can become a citizen scientist. You can work with Donna Taylor. Donna, wave your hand again. Donna, Donna manages our citizen science uh, research at the Civil Oak Nature Center, and you could be a monitor for the Heron Rookery, or you could be on the stream team. And by the way, the stream team is the, the, the how many how many stream teams started, and how, I mean, what's our what's our, what the, of the five teams that started between 1991 and 1996, we are one of the five that has been doing it continuously. Since we are one of the five teams for the Texas stream team that has been doing it. So that's pretty amazing. We're consistent. But we are committed. <laughs> and, and you too can be a part of that. You can come to the Nature Center and become a citizen scientist and you know, get your hands in the dirt and your toes in the creek and, and, and be a part of um, the, the protection of our watershed. And then, of course, we need your money. <laughs> so you can always send donations to the Civil Oak Nature Center and help us to continue our good work in the preservation of the um, the Cibolo watershed. And I want to thank you all for being here because just by being here, you're demonstrating your care and your commitment to our precious water resources and our land. Thank you.